As an adult, probably one of the most detrimental things I've ever done to my mental health was work for loan sharks for three and a half years. It's the kind of thing that happens when a recession hits and you're out of work for a year and a half and you jump at the first thing you're offered. The first cash advance place I worked was a pretty typical tumble-down, low-end New York business. I had worked and tempted at them before. Files piled up everywhere, bad lighting, possible fire code violations. It was my coworker who mentioned to me while he was training me that cash advance was sketchy and basically legalized loan sharking. But we were shielded from most of the sketch, so to speak. We were reference administrators. Most of our job was just to call landlords, vendors, and the occasional bank of the small businesses applying for cash advances or loans to make sure their payment history was unassailable or as unassailable as your payment history can be if you're applying for a cash advance. Uh, It was a pretty quiet, fairly laid back job. The skeeviest thing that happened while I was there was one day a business associate sent over an old timey burlesque stripper to the office to uh, sit on our boss's lap and dance around him and sing this song about how he was a lion weasel. Uh, But after nine months, they were restructuring. All these cash advance places were constantly restructuring. It's like... uh, It's like working for a giant game of Jenga. They're constantly removing pieces to see how many pieces they can get away with not having and and still have a business that's standing. And I was one of the pieces that they could do without. Um, However, they were nice enough to refer me to another cash advance place. And I was still remembering what it was like to be unemployed for like 18 months. So I said, yeah. At the new company, we were in an open plan office where everybody could see what everyone else was doing all the time. And the sales floor was like a barnyard with sales reps rocketing over and bothering us whenever they felt like. Now, at the first cash advance company I worked at, uh, the, the underwriters were sort of like a buffer between us and the sales reps. So the sales reps didn't end up bothering us too much. But at this new company, the underwriters were more like exhausted substitute teachers who just didn't care anymore. Uh, My direct supervisor was an underwriter. And if you complain to him saying, uh, these guys are harassing me, they're, they're driving me crazy, he would just be like, what do you want me to do about it? The workload expectation wasn't realistic. Trying to get the work done of dozens of sales reps who treat you like a cross between a garbage can and a toilet is like trying to put out a fire on the sun. And if you couldn't get the work done, you were lazy. Inside their implications of the word lazy were loser and possibly woman. Most of the sales reps for most of the time I worked there were bros. I don't want to call them men because I don't want to insult all the men of planet Earth who aren't bros. These are guys who think it's funny and typical when a woman gets upset because all women are emotional. These are guys who think you're taking advantage and slacking off if you take a lunch or go to the bathroom or leave on time. They work on commission, and that's all that matters to them. They lie to their customers and then wait for customer service to clean it up on the back end. They have drugs delivered to the office. When someone threatens to sue them, their response is, tell them we'll pick them up on the way to the courthouse, because these guys go to court like they're going to the bathroom. One day, one of these guys slapped one of the underwriter's hands in a threatening manner and faced almost no disciplinary charges. These guys laugh about potentially funding convicted murderers, registered sex offenders, and people on the terror watch list. These guys say things like, well, there's rape, and then there's rape. Inappropriate talk, to put it politely, was the culture of that office. When our boss brought his dog to work one day and the dog acted skittish around everyone in the office... 
Our boss joked that she was probably the most frightened of one of our Korean co-workers because she was scared that this particular employee would eat her. When this same Korean employee ended up in the hospital with an illness and his coloring became sickly, the HR lady went to visit him and mentioned that he looked even yellower than usual. When our receptionist filed a sexual harassment complaint, the same HR lady told her that sexual harassment was just something that women in offices had to deal with. Everyone in the office blamed our receptionist when we had to sit through this sexual harassment seminar that we had as a result of the complaint. Even though, as far as I know, she had never said anything inappropriate to anybody. Nobody really blamed the guy who harassed her, though, even though he said things in the office like he was pro-life and he didn't care if abortion is made illegal. Because if women don't mind having some guy's dick up there, they shouldn't mind having a pair of scissors up there either. Apparently, he thought illegal abortions were performed the same way you cut an umbilical cord. When the female moderator of the lecture was getting set up, my direct supervisor joked that she had never had sex in her life. The moderator would come up with scenarios and ask us what the appropriate way to deal with them was. One scenario was, if a female coworker comes to you and you're her superior and she says that she feels she's not being treated fairly by a male coworker that she had a relationship, what do you do? I told her to get back to work, one of the sales reps said. Another scenario, if a superior asks you to accompany them to an industry event as their date, what do you say? I'd go, because that's what being part of a team means. Evidently, according to our receptionist anyways, being part of a team also meant that once a year the top execs at the company flew down to Costa Rica and took turns banging the same hooker, which would be none of my business. However, I would sure love to know how the receptionist at the company knew about it. If company resources weren't being utilized in some way to facilitate the trip. These were the guys that I was working for. These guys were bad guys. At the last company Christmas party I would ever attend, there was a female coworker there who got a little too drunk and a little too out of control and handsy and fresh and grab assy with other coworkers at the party, both male and female. I wasn't there, I'd already left the party by that time. This woman who had gotten drunk and done this, she, uh, she didn't come to work the next day, but about mid-morning, other coworkers started getting phone calls from her. She was calling people saying that she'd gone to an after party afterwards with our bosses and some of the other execs from the company. And she didn't know what happened at the party and she didn't know how she got home. And she was asking people if any, any of them knew what had happened. When some of the guys finally came into work who she claimed to be with at this after party, and they were just like, no, whatever, she's crazy, she's nuts, don't listen to her, she's crazy. And everybody believed these guys, or at least seemed to. Finally, our HR lady told her to stop calling and she never came back to work and I didn't see her again. And she never called me. I don't know what I would have done if she had. I definitely changed while I worked there. I started cursing at people loudly in the office and firing off super bitch emails to other people in the company, including vice presidents. Um, The receptionist told me at one point that the bosses were even kind of scared of me. I guess being a scary monster felt better than crying in the bathroom all the time, but it didn't feel good. I mean, nothing felt good, not for the two and a half years I worked there, all the way up until one of the vice presidents finally decided to have my job automated and have my job phased out. They said that they would try to find me something else at the company, but I had a feeling that they probably wouldn't, and I kind of didn't care. And then two weeks later, when they laid me off for sure, on the day they laid me off, that was a day I'll never forget. 
because on that day, none of my bosses came to work. And the HR lady who had hired me didn't come to work either. It was my direct supervisor laying me off, as well as a new HR lady who had only just recently been hired. My therapist used to tell me that uh, it was good that I was working at this company in a way because it was forcing me to deal with certain issues. Mainly, I have issues with standing up to people. I have a hard time doing it. And I was constantly being prodded and pushed and hassled and harassed at this company about working faster or working the right way or just trying to measure up to some unrealistic expectation so I finally did have to push back against these guys and like learn how to stand up for myself within the context of this job anyways so I guess what my therapist said is like okay but I'm kind of done learning lessons about myself if it means I have to deal with assholes and when I say that I don't mean I've like reached some enlightened plane where I don't need to learn any more lessons. I guess I'm just saying that I'm happy to stall out where I am if it means I don't have to deal with jag bags anymore. And I always wonder how often I'll tell this story. I guess it doesn't matter now. I mean, I'm recording it, so it doesn't matter if I tell the story again or not. I, I don't even mention any names of anybody. I don't mention the name of the company, but I still get skittish because I don't know because these guys go to court like they're going to the bathroom because they're not great guys because if they were to hear this they would sit back and smile and laugh and assure everyone that everything was fine she's not she's crazy she didn't know what she's talking about whatever it's fine and a lot of people would believe them These guys from nice homes who went to good schools, who root for the same sports teams a lot of you root for, and who sound exactly the same when they're lying as when they tell the truth. That was From Nice Homes by Mary Regan. Mary is a performer and artist who's appeared in plays at La Mama, etc., the Looking Glass Theater, the Fringe Festival in New York City, and the Musical Theater Factory. And I know her as a frequent presence at Talk Therapy Stories. And in addition to acting and storytelling and performing and writing 
She's an excellent writer. Um, she also writes and draws comics. So you can get all the information about what Mary does, which is a lot, on the show page. Uh, I'm working on the next episode, and uh, I looked back and noticed a pattern that with Daylight Savings Time came some darker stories for this podcast, and I think what's happened is that people are beginning to think of this as a dark podcast, which it is, uh, but I don't want it to be that all of the time. So the next few episodes, I'm uh, going to be introducing a little levity, and they will be a bit lighter, although by no means lightweight. And I also wanted to let anyone who's listening and who lives in the New York City area know that this podcast is now open for pitches. I have For the first year, I decided to make this an invitation-only venture. Um, But there are a lot of people out there who I don't know and who I think are probably great storytellers. And so I have um, opened up a pitch page where if you are in New York City and you can get yourself to Yonkers, to my studio, to record, and you pitch me a story that I think is interesting and fits with the podcast... um, we can make it happen. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm looking for stories that are between 10 and 30 minutes, provided by people who aren't terribly allergic to cats or afraid of small spaces. And if you'd like to pitch, you can go to modernstories.com slash mix slash pitch. I'm recording this on a, a new microphone, a Shure SM7B. Uh, I, and I say this because two reasons. One is I, I just didn't like the way my voice sounded on the microphone that I record storytellers on, which is an MXL4000. I know this is incredibly geeky, but what can I say? I get excited about this stuff. Um, but the other reason I bought a second microphone is that I'm interested in recording two storytellers telling the same story or who experience the same thing and both have a version of the story to tell. So um, I just wanted to put out there that I'm also looking for that as a pitch. Obviously it helps if both of the people are storytellers. And the usual, uh, I have... um, I have exclusively garnered five-star reviews on iTunes. Not many of them, but all of them are five stars, and I'm very proud of that. And I would love it if you are a fan of this podcast to also go rate it on iTunes. And if you have an extra 30 seconds, if you could pen a review, that would also be great. So that's about it. Uh, I'm working on the next episode, which I'm very excited about because it's extremely funny. And um, I expect to have that out sometime in February. So February. It's a stupid word. Anyway, I'll uh, be back next month. Have a great... Well, it's still going to be winter, but have a great um, portion of the winter until then. Bye.